One of the big challenges in acute lymphoblastic leukemia is uh, the risk of the patient relapsing in their uh, central nervous system. Um, and in uh, central nervous system leukemia, patients have infiltration of the lining around the brain of the meninges. Uh, that uh, can uh, be a sanctuary site where chemotherapy doesn't get into that area well. This is systemic chemotherapy that we give through the vein or by uh, oral medication. So we know that if we don't do prophylaxis and try to prevent the CNS occurrence of the leukemia, that this will happen in more than 50% of the patients. So over the years, there's been refinements in the treatment in the prophylaxis or prevention of CNS leukemia. And this treatment is given in conjunction with the systemic chemotherapy that we give, again, either intravenously and or orally to treat their bone marrow disease and, and other sites of the leukemia. The treatment of CNS, or the, I'm sorry, the prevention of CNS leukemia has been based on uh, primarily on intrathecal chemotherapy. So we do spinal taps and we sample the, the cerebral spinal fluid to see if there's any leukemic involvement and then we inject chemotherapy. We can also use high doses of certain chemotherapy drugs like methotrexate or cytarabine that can cross into the CNS and help to treat that leukemia. And what we have found over the years is that combining intrathecal chemotherapy with high doses of these drugs like methotrexate and cytarabine can significantly reduce the risk of development uh, of CNS leukemia later in the course of the patient's treatment. Cranial irradiation, or sometimes radiation both to the cranium, to the head, and to the spine can also be effective in preventing the development of CNS leukemia, but is associated with more side effects, and particularly in children, it can be associated with uh, delay in uh, mental development and even slowing of mental development. So in pediatrics, uh, they've largely moved away from using cranial irradiation and are relying on intrathecal therapy and also systemic therapy. Uh, for adults, we're also moving in that direction uh, as well. Uh, if someone, despite that, uh, re uh, relapses in their cerebral spinal fluid, or if we find uh, at diagnosis that they have leukemia in their spinal fluid, then that presents additional challenges to us. We can frequently get that under control with the intrathecal chemotherapy. We sometimes also will add cranial irradiation. There's some controversy about whether those patients should be are at higher risk for a poor outcome in the future and if they should have a transplant. Many of us think that a transplant should be considered for them. There's things that we can do at the time of a transplant to also try to reduce the risk of the leukemia coming back in the spinal fluid after the transplant. We'll sometimes give a, some extra radiation to the brain, we call it a cranial boost, and then we often use total body radiation as part of a conditioning regimen for transplant, which also very effectively treats the, the, the CNS. Um, we're also getting additional understanding of how CNS leukemia can develop. Uh, there have been some interesting laboratory studies that have given us some new insights into how the leukemia cells, we think that leukemia typically starts in the bone marrow, how it can spread into the cerebral spinal fluid. So hopefully those studies will also give us some new insights on how we can treat CNS leukemia as well. Well, an important consideration is uh, the patient's age. Um, we don't like to use that by itself. We also take into account other uh, factors such as comorbidities that the patient may have, if they have liver disease, if they're diabetic, if they have heart disease. So those are also considerations. But uh, for younger patients, uh, we think that a pediatric intensive regimen that I mentioned uh, can be uh, the most effective way to get them into remission and keep them there and may even prevent them from needing to have a transplant. There are new uh, immunotherapies that have been developed. Uh, blinatumumab, a bispecific T-cell engaging antibody that brings a T-cell close to the leukemic blast and can kill it. 
uh, has been shown to be very effective in the relapse setting and putting patients back in remission. It doesn't tend to keep them there, but it can serve as what we call a bridge to transplant uh, and get them into remission so that we can then more safely take them to transplant. There are now studies uh, going on um, in the United States and Europe to bring these immunotherapies into the upfront setting and so to combine them with chemotherapy to try to get deeper remissions to get patients to a minimal residual negative disease state uh, uh, and so a better quality remission. And we think that, that, that these treatments will improve the number of patients that can get into remission and we think may even allow us to give less chemotherapy given how effective these treatments are. One other one that's important is a drug called inatuzumab ozogamycin, which combines an antibody to CD22, which is expressed on most B cell um, ALL blasts and is linked to a chemotherapy drug. So it delivers a chemotherapy drug right to the blast, is also showing very high response rates and can be effective with chemotherapy. The most exciting treatment in ALL is the chimeric antigen receptor T cells or the CAR T cells. Uh, those are also highly effective in the relapse refractory setting. Um, we're not as far along in how we're going to bring those up to the upfront setting and use those with newly diagnosed patients, but I think there's going to be studies that eventually will look at that in, the, in that setting. I mean, our hope is that by getting more patients into remission and keeping them there, we can lessen the need for transplant, which is highly effective, but also has a lot of short and long-term side effects.